decided that Salim is a successful angel. And I thought, how fabulous. What a great way to describe yourself. And of course, it should have read angel investor and entrepreneur. But I have a feeling he's a little bit of both. He is the global ambassador of the Singularity University, which is a place that tries to train managers in coaching with literally thousands of levels of technological change. He's also someone that has a deep background in technology, both with Yahoo and with a number of other companies. And I was delighted to read that his last successful company was by, by Google in 2010. So he's very much an ideas man, and we look forward to him amplifying on what John talked about and specifically looking at what Singularity University does to capture some of these ideas. Thank you. <laughs> I believe devil is a better way to describe it. We'll see how the first time. Uh, how many of you have a sense of what Singularity University is? How many of you have heard of this? Oh, great. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so my goal in this next 10 minutes is to really blow open your conceptions of what a university used to be like, because we think we're taking on a completely new model. So we're a nonprofit organization hosted at NASA Ames. There are 10 NASA centers around the country, and I'm off the field here, they do well with the R&D and supercomputing. Uh, we're sponsored by Autodesk and Kia Google and a bunch of other large organizations. And we're creating a new type of educational institution, pivoting around the basic idea that technology is accelerating much faster than our ability to manage it. Right? So if you look at this graph, uh, our, our 10 years ago, a thousand dollar laptop had the equivalent computing power of about the brain of an insect. Uh, today we have the equivalent computing power of about the brain of a mouse. In about 10 or 12 years, we'll have the equivalent computing power of the brain of one human being in that laptop. And in 30 or 40 years, all 9 billion human beings' computing power, their brain power, will be in that thousand dollar laptop. And the question is, what would we do with that? Right? We, have a, we think we have a difficult time predicting where technology is going, but actually we, we challenge that. We know exactly how many chip cycles will be in your devices in the next three years, five years, or ten years. Moore's Law has predicted that. What we're lacking is the imagination as to what we would do with that. And that's where we come in. We've seen technology get exponentially cheaper, smaller, better, faster, and it's disrupting every aspect of our lives today. So the, the few co-founders of SU are uh, Ray Kurzweil, who talks a lot about this exponential thinking and the accelerating dynamics of the uncertain technology, and Peter Diamandis who created the X-Prize Foundation. And this is the key graph that I think is, uh, we pivot around. Because if you look at this graph, this tracks back the exponential growth in computing, essentially Moore's law, right? So Gordon Moore, the head of Intel in the 60s, predicted that the price performance of computing would double every 18 months. And every, over 60 years, it's held absolutely true. And Ray went back and tracked it back over 100 years to show that the information capability and the processing power has been doubling for over 100 years. And the question that he asked himself is, why is that curve so smooth? We have ups and downs in the semiconductor industry, we have wars, we have recessions, and yet the doubling pattern has been incredibly steady at a slightly more than exponential rate of the log scale on the left-hand side. And he basically studied this issue for about 15 or 20 years. And he came up with a fundamental observation that once any domain becomes information enabled and gets powered by informational properties, it goes into a doubling pattern and will stay on that path. So for example, now that we sequence the human, human genome, medicine is in that rapidly accelerating uh, environment, and the cost of sequencing the gene has dropped very dramatically over the last 10 years. Um, two and a half years ago, there was a founding conference at NASA Ames where they brought together 50 or 60 thought leaders from around Silicon Valley and asked the question, is it worth creating an educational institution focused on fast-moving technologies? And there were two very interesting observations that came from this. Uh, Larry Page, the uh, CEO of Google, got up and said, look, if we're bringing together top thinkers in these fast-moving areas, focus on the biggest problems. Right? We don't have enough smart, thoughtful people addressing the biggest problems in the world. And the second problem, the one that really struck me, was that if you look at some of our global issues, the financial crisis or the spread of pandemics or aspects of climate change, these global challenges are rooted in accelerating factors and exponential factors. Right? The, the spread of a pandemic is exponential. Or the financial crisis, as we've noted, was triggered by the ripple effects and the accelerations in those derivatives. Our leadership around the world does not understand this phenomenon, business or political, especially political. Right? And intuitively, human beings don't understand this fundamental paradigm of an acceleration. We are linearly geared to seeing where a bird in the sky and biologically thinking about where that bird will be. 
and extrapolating linearly. And we can, if I take 30 steps linearly, I'll get to the other side of the room. And it's pretty easy to think where I would be in steps, steps 10 and steps 20 and steps 30. If I take 30 steps and I double it every step, I get to a billion, 25 times around the world. And it's very hard to imagine where will I be one third of the way or two thirds of the way. And that's essentially the problem that we have. We have a biological uh, evolutionary issue here in, in understanding intuitively this exponential curve. Yet our world is becoming more and more accelerated. Right? If you go back even three generations, our world was local and linear, and pretty well everything that happened that was relevant to you happened within a day's walk or a horse ride. Today, something that happens around the world affects us in minutes. And so our, we, we need to adapt to this. Uh, so our mission is to find a new generation, the next generation of leadership in the world, teach them where these fast-moving technologies are growing, and think about how would we harness these technologies to address the biggest problems in the world. Now, the reason we focus on accelerating technologies, they're all naturally scaling to a global level. And therefore, if you create solutions with them, they can scale naturally. And the second observation is that if we don't solve some of these global challenges, clean water, for example, if we don't solve them with technology, then we end up in war, right? And war is a very expensive way of progressing humanity. And we've used technology repeatedly, the ROI is much better. So um, we focus, we have two programs. The heart of it is a 10-week graduate studies program that we do every summer, uh, which starts in 48 hours. Um, we bring together 80 of the top graduate students around the world. We study these 10 disciplines. And those ones that you see on the top left are the core technologies that are doubling in their price performance anywhere from 18 to 30 months. AI, robotics, nanotech, uh, biotech, medicine, all powered by computing. We study the future studies and management, the, the uh, uh, ethics, which is a key think aspect of ours. As these technologies are accelerating, they can be used for good or for evil. And so we try and teach responsible use of these technologies. And we think of energy and space as application areas where we might deploy these technologies. We launched this as a trial program two years ago, two summers ago. And the big challenge we have is the curricular risk of how do you take 10 incredibly broad subject areas and squeeze it down into 10 weeks and deliver any documents, right? Um, we have for each of those 10 disciplines a set of global advisors, uh, global thought leaders, anybody from Vince Cerf, who invented the internet, to Will Wright, who created uh, some such things in score, et cetera. And for each of those, we have a, a track chair who helps orchestrate the curriculum. Uh, and what's interesting to them is, as, as John noted, disruptive innovation always happens when you cross two very disparate fields together. Right? And so what we're doing here, essentially, we're bringing together the top end students in the world, from around the world, giving them an education of where are the fastest moving technologies going, pointing them at the biggest problems, and seeing what happens. Something interesting will happen out of this. Um, our head of faculty, for example, Dan Berry, the three-time space shuttle astronaut, uh, has an NP PhD and also is an expert in robotics. Or uh, John Gage, the chief researcher, his son. Or uh, Daniel Kraft, who runs the Sentel Lab at Stanford. And what's interesting to these folks is you can be a global expert in nanotech, but all the disruptive innovation is happening between the cracks, at the interstitials between nanotech and AI, between robotics and medicine. Right? And we get to explore those engagements. So we did, the students we looked for at the top of their class academically, they've done something entrepreneurial or leadership in their, in their careers, and they're interested and committed in addressing global challenges. Uh, we had 40 students in the first year um, and 80 students this last summer, and that's about full size for us. Uh, the 10 weeks looks look roughly like this. The students come in, they get for about the first half of the summer, they get about 300 hours of lectures from 160 different speakers on what is the future of biotech, nanotech, robotics, medicine. Different from classic education, we spend 80% of our curriculum on what's likely to happen in the future. Most education thinks about what's happened in the past, right? How does this model evolve, how does this equation develop, et cetera. We focus a lot of our time on what's going to happen in the future. Uh, what's in the labs today? What's going to be commercialized tomorrow? What trigger point to look for? The second half of the summer, they form teams and actually put into action some of these technologies. And they, we call it the 10th and 9th program. And their objective is come up with a product or service that would impact a billion people within 10 years. We're in Silicon Valley, right? So we have to aim big. We want to blow apart any preconceived thinking and any limits they've had in their minds before. Um, and they form teams around a grand challenge clean water, or home energy, or climate change, or public health, etc. 
Um, at the end of the summer, we spin these out as NGOs, for-profit companies, research initiatives, etc. And we we know them. So we're one part incubator, one part university, one part think tank, etc. Quite a hybrid. Um, for as an example, this team looked at the rise of 3D printing and control systems and robotics, and they looked at the housing industry and noticed, you know, the way we build houses today fundamentally hasn't changed in what 5,000 years. So they devised a crane-shaped device, looks a little bit like a car wash, running on rails with a nozzle in the middle, that will 3D print a house in a day. Sorry about that. So it'll 3D print a house in about a day and a half. And, uh, am I not? Okay. Um, and using sand in the Middle East or concrete or adobe if you're in a developing country. Another example is this team looked at, uh, in, during a lecture on synthetic molecules and synthetic biology, noticed a new molecule that has the property of being very efficient to separate water from salt and developed maybe the first low-cost desalinization solution. Okay. Um, our first ever spin-out called Get Around looks at, looked at the peer-to-peer -peer car sharing idea. They just won a major prize at, at an innovation conference in New York a couple of weeks ago. They were starting to have see success with the model. Uh, we spun out four ideas in the first year, ten last year. Uh, the students will form some number of companies today. Um, our themes for this, our themes for this uh, last year were food, home energy, upcycling, water, space, etc. Now we've been pushing the, uh, the the envelope on a number of different levels. I mentioned our biggest challenge was uh, um, our biggest challenge has been student selection. We had last year 1,600 applicants from 85 countries for the 80 slots. This year it was 2,200 applicants from 100 different countries. Uh, down selecting is a big challenge for us. And so we piloted a program with a Brazilian university. And we said to them, tell you what, we're going to guarantee you one of the 80 slots. We ran a mini X Prize. We went out to their 10,000 students and alumni around Sao Paulo and said, one of you will get to go to Singularity University for the summer, study with the top thought leaders in the world, work on projects that might impact a billion people. To win, come up with an idea that would impact a million people around your area and start a company. Show some gumption and show some initiative. Uh, at the end of the two months when they ran it, we found that 230 projects had been picked up. And I got incredibly excited about that. Because I thought, my God, if you could run that in every major city around the world, change, you would actually change the world. So uh, we just finished this year running a dozen of these uh, contests, uh, 12 contests in eight countries around the world and left behind a trail of very interesting projects, some of which may have a great impact at the local level. Um, one of the more interesting and bizarre attributes of our model is that if you think of biotech or robotics or medicine or AI, they're all changing incredibly quickly. This is a photograph from our curriculum planning meeting. We bring our entire faculty together for two weekends in December and April, and we revisit the entire curriculum, every lecture, because we have to. And this puts us interestingly at odds with any kind of regulatory framework, because to get accredited and to be an accredited institution, you have to set your curriculum and not change it. Right? And something we think about a great deal is how does any regulatory framework keep pace as technology is accelerating away from it? So we have a global issue around it. So uh, Larry Page gave us our money quote that's all over our website. Um, we also run a one-week executive program where we give existing leaders in the world a crash course on what are these major breakthroughs. Uh, we focus on the core six technologies, we do a half day on each of them, and then we have Ideal and Autodesk come in and help facilitate a half of the, of the week. And then we spin out uh, ideas. The, uh, the basic idea behind this is, you know, it took all of history to create the first billion dollar company in the 40s. It took about 30 years to create the next one, and about 15 years to create the next one. Google took about seven years, Facebook about four years, and many of you are familiar with Groupon, which has received, reached a billion dollar revenue run rate in 18 months. Okay. The, the metabolism of the world, the economy is increasing, and how do we manage that with that increased metabolism? If you're in a legacy industry, how do you make sure that technology doesn't come along or suddenly wipe you up? Right? How do you not become Kodak? Um, so that's essentially as you, we bring this, the, these folks and we try and change their brain waves in terms of thinking in this doubling pattern. We send them back to their home countries and their environments and see the future uh, with these industries. We've received a, a lot of uh, attention internationally. I did a talk at the State Department last summer, uh, at Shimon Paris a few months ago, and we're about to sign a deal with the Italian government to uh, drive all of the technology thinking behind the World Expo. Which